Today on the Perception in Action podcast, just in time for the start of the World Series, a look at vision and gaze behavior in baseball batting. Which aspects of vision are critical for hitting? Do great batters have superior vision? Where do good batters look before the ball is released? And how should we be evaluating research on the role of vision in sports? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to look at a few recent studies related to vision and gaze behavior in baseball batting. Although the focus will be on baseball, I think there are also a lot of important lessons here for other sports, in particular in terms of interpreting research findings. The first questions I want to consider are ones that I addressed in the very first episode of this podcast. Do elite athletes see better than normal people? Are superhuman visual abilities necessary for being successful in sports like baseball? Before looking at a couple studies on this topic, I want to discuss three important issues we should keep in mind when reading studies like this. The first is what is called type 1 error. As I think most people know, in research we evaluate whether effects are statistically significant or not. Traditionally, the criterion used to establish significance is that the probability of a given outcome is less than 5%, or 1 in 20. Or, stated another way, as researchers, we all accept that, if we do nothing else, when we measure 20 things, one of them will be statistically significant purely by chance, where there is no actual real effect. Claiming that there is a difference between things when there really is not is called a type 1 error. There are ways to correct for it, which essentially involve decreasing the criterion for each additional test you use. The reason I bring all of this up is that many of the published studies on perceptual abilities in sport make multiple measurements, often more than 20, with no correction for type 1 error at all. Thus, it's highly likely that some of the effects reported are simply due to chance. I will give some specific examples shortly. The second issue I want to mention is the definitions of expert and elite used in most studies on vision in sport. In all of the studies I'm going to discuss today, professional baseball players were used, which is very impressive, and indeed is at a higher level than the college players I use in most of my research. However, this might not be as impressive as you might think. Professional in baseball means signed to a contract by a major league team. That could mean you're playing in the minors or the major leagues. There are 247 different minor league teams with 20 players on the roster, and 30 major league teams with 25 players. That is nearly 6,000 baseball players. So I think it's really important that we look at what specific level that players are competing at, which some of the studies do and others do not. Even though they might be quote-unquote professional, I don't think we want to label all 6,000 of them as elite. For a really good discussion of the general issue of defining levels of expertise in sports research, I would highly recommend the article by Swan and colleagues from 2014. Link in the show notes. The final and most important issue concerning this type of research is the face validity of the abilities that are being measured. How do they relate to the actual sports skill? Does it make sense that they would be important? If I told you that I did some research and found that good baseball batters are better at judging what key a piece of music is played in as compared to lesser skill batters, you would immediately dismiss this finding out of hand as being completely meaningless because it has low face validity. When we do a task analysis of what is involved in hitting a baseball, perception of music is clearly not involved. Therefore, the finding is likely just one of those chance findings I was discussing a moment ago, or it could be just the consequence of some other third variable. For example, playing sports like baseball can be expensive, so maybe it's the case that kids that compete in the highest leagues have richer parents that can more likely afford to put them through music lessons. I'm not saying this is true, just illustrating that sometimes a third hidden variable, like socioeconomic status, can explain a significant relationship between another two. So, considering face validity is critical. But, for some reason most people lose sight of this, pun intended, when talking about vision research. 
Remember, the word vision actually refers to several different abilities, including the ability to see fine details, color, depth, motion, motion in depth, shape, size, texture, to name only a few. Therefore, it's critical that we remember, even though undoubtedly hitting a baseball is a highly visual task, it does not mean that all aspects of quote-unquote vision will be involved. There are several visual abilities that will be irrelevant to hitting. So, we need to look at each specific visual test being used and ask, is this really part of the skill of baseball batting? Okay, with these things in mind, let's get to the research. Before getting into new research, I want to look at a study that is considered to be a classic in this area and is frequently cited as evidence that supranormal vision is needed to be an elite baseball batter. It was conducted by Leiby and colleagues in 1996 and involved measuring several different visual abilities for 387 professional players, including both major and minor leaguers. They were all part of the Los Angeles Dodgers organization. Test scores were compared for minor versus major league players, so good that they made this distinction, and also all players' data were compared to a sample of normal adults. The study involved three types of tests, visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, and stereo acuity. Visual acuity and contrast sensitivity essentially measure our ability to see details in an image in two different ways. An acuity test is similar to the standard letter chart that most people are aware of and expresses performance in the familiar 20-20 ratio. Contrast sensitivity, which I've talked about a few times on the podcast, gives a more fine-grained analysis where you can measure sensitivity at different levels of detail, or what are called spatial frequencies. So for example, you can measure how well a person can see an image with very coarse detail versus one with very fine detail. What face validity do these two tests have for baseball batting? Well, I would say it's low to moderate. Being able to see details, for example the laces on the ball, is important for batting because it allows a batter to tell what type of pitch is being thrown. However, these two tests measure static acuity. That is, the ability to resolve details for a non-moving object, where baseball batting clearly involves dynamic visual acuity, which of course involves seeing details for an object in motion. As I discussed back in episode 1, a person's dynamic visual acuity is not always predictable from their static visual acuity. So, I think these tests tell us something, but they may not be directly related to what a batter is actually doing. But anyways, what did Leiby and colleagues find with regards to these two tests? For visual acuity, the results were quite striking in comparison to the normal population. Remember, the 20-20 ratio expresses the distance at which the person being evaluated can read a letter as the top number or numerator, and the distance at which a normal person can read the letter as the bottom number or the denominator. So 20-20 means the person being evaluated has normal vision. If the denominator is less than 20, it means the person has better than normal vision. 70% of the player's eyes tested in the Labian and Colleague study had visual acuity of 2015 or better. 42% had visual acuity of 2012.5 or better, and about 2% had visual acuity of 29. So think about that. What a normal person needs to be nine feet away to read and see clearly, some players can see from a distance over two times that at 20 feet. The physiological limit of visual acuity is commonly believed to be about 28. So these results are indeed incredible. Clearly this study shows that professional baseball players have better visual acuity than the normal population, an effect that has been found in other studies as well. However, there was no significant differences in the visual acuity between the minor and major league players in the Leiby study. So let's think about what this means. As the authors acknowledge, it is highly likely that the difference in acuity between baseball professionals and the normal population is due to a selection process, with players with poor acuity getting weeded out at lower levels of competition. So to me, this study shows that you can't be a good baseball player with vision that is worse than normal. But what it does not show is that as you keep increasing your acuity above the normal level, it will necessarily make you a better batter. For example, there is no evidence that having 29 acuity results in better batting performance than having 2015 acuity. 
For more discussion of this issue, check out episode 14A, where I review the book C to Play. Now let's look at the contrast sensitivity results. For this, the authors compared the performance of minor and major leaguers for different levels of detail, which is expressed in a unit called cycles per degree, or CPD. A higher CPD means more fine detail in the image. Leiby and colleagues actually used three different tests of contrast sensitivity. In their analysis, they found significant differences for the minor and major leaguers at two levels for one of the tests, specifically three and six cycles per degree. So, this suggests that better hitters might be more sensitive for coarser details in an image. However, this is where the type 1 error issue comes in. In total, the authors made 14 different measurements of contrast sensitivity and found two significant results. Without any correction for type 1 error, this is starting to get a little bit close to the level of chance. Finally, let's look at the results for stereo acuity. First, what about the face validity of this test? Well, to me, it is very low. Stereo acuity is a measure of a person's ability to judge the relative depth of two objects that are very close together by combining the images from your two eyes. One common way that has been measured is using the Howard Dolman rod test. In this test, the viewer is presented with two narrow rods and asked to say which one is closer. The idea here is that because the rods are so narrow, all other depth cues like relative size are removed. So only stereoscopic cues, or more accurately binocular disparity, are available. So, key point here, this test is measuring relative depth perception, not absolute distance perception. That is, we're not measuring how well the batter can judge how far away a ball is from the plate based on binocular visual cues which may or may not be important for batting. We are measuring how well they can tell which is closer to them, the ball or the pitcher, which seems pretty irrelevant to effective batting. But anyways, I'll return to this issue shortly. Let's look at the Laby and colleagues results. Of the five stereo acuity tests they used, major leaguers were found to have significantly better performance than minor leaguers on two of the tests. Again, raising questions about face validity, the major leaguers did better than the minor leaguers when the test was untimed. When they had to make the judgments quickly, which certainly would seem to be relevant to batting, there was no difference. So in sum, I'm not sure these stereoacuity results really tell us much about hitting a baseball. Now let's look at a recent study that investigated some of the same issues. Earlier this year, Clemish and colleagues used the Nike Sensory Station to measure perceptual abilities in 566 baseball players, including 112 high school players and 369 professionals. The results were also compared to data for 86 college players. Of the total number of players examined, 358 were position players or hitters, and 208 were pitchers. The author's key question of interest was whether or not there would be significant difference between pitchers and hitters with the prediction that the latter would have better visual and perceptual abilities. The sensory station included nine tests, with assessments of visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, reaction time, stereo acuity, working memory, and eye-hand coordination. What was found? Across all the tests, only two showed significant differences for pitchers and hitters. Specifically, professional hitters had significantly better contrast sensitivity and stereo acuity than professional pitchers. There are no significant positional differences for either high school or college players. So, let's look at the results a little more carefully. First, again, there is a potential type 1 error issue here. The study compared 9 test scores at 3 levels of play, so 27 tests, and found 2 significant differences. This is again getting close to the range of having spurious chance findings. Second, Let's look at the contrast sensitivity results. When these test scores are converted to acuity values, the professional hitters had an average acuity of 2014, while the professional pitchers had an average acuity of 20 over 15.7. So the hitters were better by about a foot and a half. But notice, both are well above normal. If being able to see details is something that is so critically linked to being a good hitter, why would pitchers have such good scores too? Why do pitchers need to be able to see in such clear detail? 
This suggests that these superior abilities are the reflection of some other variable. I will get to that in a second. Finally, what about the fact that there was a difference in stereo acuity between pro batters and pro pitchers? Well again, this test has low face validity. It involved presenting players with four circles and asking them to identify which one was slightly closer. And again, pitchers were found to have better stereo acuity than the normal population, suggesting it's not an ability directly linked to hitting. The final study I want to look at with regards to visual abilities in baseball batting is a training study by Clark and colleagues published in 2015. This study is an extension of one I talked about way back in episode 2. These researchers have been training players from the University of Cincinnati baseball team for several years, using a variety of different visual training devices including stroboscopic glasses, the Brock string test, the iSport system, and DynaVision. In this 2015 study, the authors investigated whether this training resulted in any significant changes in the depth perception for the players. Before looking at the results, it should be noted that this paper is rife with errors in logic that highlight the lack of consideration of face validity in this type of research. For example, the authors write, quote, An important component of the assessment of the pitch is speed, which is in part determined by using the depth perception to determine how fast the ball is coming at the batter. The change in distance divided by unit time determines speed. End quote. First, the idea that we need to compute time and distance to get speed is flawed because we can just use tau, the rate of change of the ball's retinal image size. Second, if we were going to compute speed this way, we would need to be able to perceive absolute distance. That is how far away the ball is from us, say 25 feet. But again, the test used in the study was a measure of relative depth perception. Which of two objects is closer? But anyways, what was found? Players were assessed pre and post season for three consecutive years. At the start of each of the seasons, their stereo acuity was significantly lower than it was at the end of the season. At preseason, average scores ranged between 22 and 24, while at the end of the season they ranged between 35 and 45, where higher is better. So within season training consistently led to improved relative depth perception. However, these gains were completely lost and the players went back to square one during each of the off seasons. If this training was improving some fundamental visual ability related to batting, would we expect it to disappear so rapidly? I don't think so. I think a much more likely explanation for the results is related to an idea proposed by Richard Schmidt that I will talk more about in my next episode called the Activity Set Hypothesis. Basically, Schmidt proposed that performing well in a perceptual motor skill test like a stereo acuity test requires that the person being tested learn the needed activity set, where an activity set includes the optimal level of arousal, the required attentional focus, the best starting body posture and fixation location, etc. When performers go away from a test for a while, they lose this activity set. The final two studies I want to look at are ones conducted this year by Melissa Humphelvey from the company RightEye, whose president I interviewed back in episode 20A. In the first study, Melissa and colleagues looked at the relationship between batting performance and interocular distance for 20 players that had major league experience. Interocular distance is the separation between the center of your pupil in your right eye and the center of your pupil in your left eye. On average, this distance is just over 6 centimeters, but it can range from just over 5 to nearly 8 centimeters depending on the individual. The reason that it is important is that it partially determines how sensitive you are to binocular depth and binocular motion in-depth information. In general, if you have a larger interocular distance, you will be better able to use binocular cues to judge depth, direction of motion and depth, and time to contact because the signals will be stronger for these. In their study, Humphelvey and colleagues calculated the correlation between interocular distance and three measures of hitting performance, batting average, on base percentage, and OPS. What was found? Strong, significant correlations of 0.89, 0.71, and 0.69 for the three hitting variables. Although a sample of 20 is very small for calculating a reliable correlation coefficient, I think these are interesting results. 
Also, unlike many of the other measures I've been discussing, it does have good face validity because interocular distance does affect the perception of the direction of motion and depth and time to contact, both of which are highly relevant to batting. These results suggest that maybe we should be measuring interocular distance in players. This may be important because for players with a small interocular distance, this disadvantage could be partially offset by training them to use other cues for judging motion in depth. The final study I want to mention today is one very recently published by Humphelvay and colleagues which investigated what batters do with their eyes just before a pitcher goes into the delivery. As I've discussed in a few previous episodes, there's a fair bit of research now showing that what a performer does with their eyes just before acting is critical for success. Two prominent examples are the quiet eye effect, which shows that keeping the center of your vision locked on your target for a longer time before moving is beneficial, and the visual pivot point strategy, which shows that by keeping their eyes fixed on a convenient spot called the pivot point, some performers can more effectively pick up important information in peripheral vision. I discussed both of these back in episode three, and also wrote a recent blog post where I considered how these might more specifically apply to baseball batting. Link in the show notes. In their study, Humphelvay and colleagues were not interested in this final part of Gay's behavior, but rather what happens before that, before the pitcher even comes set to start the delivery. In this study, the eye movements of 58 professional players, 13 major leaguers and 14 minor leaguers, were measured using an ASL mobile eye tracker while the players were batting in the preseason. The authors did not measure specifically what the batters fixated on, but rather were only concerned whether they were looking near at the plate versus far at the pitcher, and how often they shifted between these two extreme locations. What was found? There was a large difference between batters in how often they switched between near and far. To analyze this result, the authors performed what is called a k-means cluster analysis. Basically, this involves entering a set of variables, in this case on base percentage, batting average, and number of visual shifts, and letting the analysis group the outcomes into clusters. Doing this, the authors found two distinct clusters. Cluster 1 was a group of players that had lower batting average, lower on base percentage, and fewer number of fixation shifts, while Cluster 2 was a group of players that had higher values for all three of these variables. This suggests that moving fixation back and forth, near to far, a lot before hitting, results in better batting performance. The authors suggest that this preparatory ocular motor behavior is likely a warm-up strategy. The muscles that attach to the eye are similar to the skeletal muscles in the rest of our body, so maybe they need to be warmed up too. Perhaps this warm-up also allows for better control of fixation and more precise eye movements when tracking the pitched ball. Okay. So what are the take-home messages from today's episode? First, as I've stated in the podcast a few times before, the idea that you need to be superhuman in terms of general visual abilities like acuity, contrast sensitivity, and relative depth perception to be a good hitter is really not supported by research. Yes, you can't be below normal, or you will probably get selected out, but whether it's worth the effort in continuing to improve beyond this cutoff is questionable. The second key take-home message from today is that we really need to look at the face validity of the tests we're using in sports. Athletes can be better than the normal population on a lot of things. That doesn't mean all of these are critical to becoming an elite athlete. In most cases, I think we're testing and training things that are easy and convenient to measure, rather than using things that task analysis suggests they're actually involved in the skill we're studying. Finally, I think we clearly need more research to understand gay's behavior in baseball batting. I recently wrote a blog post summarizing the current state of knowledge, and I definitely think we still have more questions than answers. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. And to find out more about this podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. They said Jesus came, gone through San Luis.